Joe Carter, and today I'd like to talk a little bit about moving with intention, taking our lives and pointing them in a direction based on choice as opposed to uh, just going with the flow or riding on the wave of environmental circumstances which we're reflecting more than uh, actually cultivating some sort of intentional purpose. Uh, we want to explore a little bit about the difference between living a, a life that's sort of uh, flowing on the currents of environment versus a life that is pointed in an intentional direction. To do that, I would like to first think about affection. We usually think about affection in terms of an attraction to something good for us, but if we honestly look at what we chase after and demonstrate as human beings, nourishing and feeling good is not the axiom of our affections. We don't pivot off of that. In fact, a lot of us are geared to cultivate an array of destructive relationships that not only diminish our personal lives, but spread the seeds of poverty across the social landscape. We affect our children, our loved ones, our parents, our friends, and so forth uh, in ways that are destructive, like some kind of a Johnny Crapple seed. Not all of us, but those that are uh, geared toward that, and all of us have uh, somewhat of an element toward that. So the question is, why do we do that? Why, why is the axiom of our affections geared in some cases and uh, largely and in some cases partially toward destructive relationships? Well, if we were to plan to characterize what we express with our lives by reverse engineering it, using our behaviors as the axiom, we would be able to title that plan, or at least many of us would, self-inflicted poverty. This bias we have toward destruction, or at least some of us do, uh, exists without any intentional plan to generate. We just recycle that same destructive waste product again and again. We could look for something or someone to blame about this, but if we tried to trace the causal links backwards to understand how we became guardians of our personal prisons, uh, our vision would soon be swallowed up by a dark horizon. It doesn't go too deep. We just don't really have the capacity to probe the depths of the causal relationships or trace the blame chain back past a few misty links. And even if we did discover, we would also discover that blame runs through people and not to them. So even if we knew the source of our personal poison, we wouldn't be able to bring the accountable person in the room and it wouldn't bring any resolution anyway. So the point is it's sort of fruitless to look there. Uh, even though a lot of us are actors in a script written largely with the spattered ink of environmental circumstance, there is something that we can cultivate out of that that is intentional, but it does require work, frankly. Uh, the environmental womb we form our identity in shapes our expectations and who we think we are. And that has a lot to do with uh, what we not only expect out of life, but what we cultivate out of life. We live under an unspoken proposition that we either learn to move with intention using whatever raw material we have to work with, which might be some destructive tendencies, or we can ride the white water rapids of chance and smash into whatever rocks happen to be uh, floating around on the bottom of our environmental riverbed. That's our real choice. So we could ask ourselves why so many of us are the authors of our own poverty, but as it turns out, it's pretty simple. The way we are shaped is that we are more attracted to what's familiar than what's nourishing. Nourishing isn't the hinge by which our behavioral life pivots. Familiarity is. If those of us who were brought up in a crappy environment don't address ourselves, we can easily develop a taste for feces butter and jelly sandwiches. That's the bottom line. Parasitic and predatory behaviors can take root in the soil of our identity as surely as nourishing behaviors can. We can express ourselves, but who that self is will either be determined by what's installed or what we choose. There's a difference there, and it's not a subtle one. Those of us that cultivate something nourishing don't do it because human beings are just the bee's knees. We do what we do because we spin in certain patterns of relationships brought about by our environment. 
And the only way to change that spin is if we cultivate self-discipline over time to overcome the momentum of environmental factors. In other words, choice involves work. It isn't just a mental flip switch that suddenly uh, creates an epiphany in our lives and poof, we're now nice people. When we typically think of our family as our environment, but it is more accurate to say that our environment is our family, the sum total of what we were exposed to, including everything from fleas and flies to the color of our eyes, gives us the impression of who we are. We develop certain rituals that mimic what we see and we learn to expect certain things on a regular basis from our environment. And after a while, we start to see what we expect more than what actually is. We'll read who we are into the environment as opposed to looking to the environment and dealing with the reality that's stemming from that. Our local and our historical environment can influence our identity in, in a lot of ways that we simply don't understand. We are behavioral creatures, we are emotional creatures, we're not uh, really strong in the cognitive areas, although we like to think we are. We develop these rituals that emerge out of the rhythmic depths of mundane things like day and night, seasons, patterns in the weather and climate, and they also emerge out of the uh, savage things that we've faced as individuals or cultures. Horrific things that happen to us or form very strong impressions on us and drive very strongly our trigger points, what we react to most passionately and emotionally about. Our demons, they can lurk in the shadows, and for some of us, they have a front row set or seat, then they heckle us on stage of life every waking hour. Those acute punctuations of chaos and suffering can have profound effects on our individual and our cultural identity. Famine and war are the same as saying parent and child if we look at things through a wide-angle lens. Once destructive behaviors are born from a womb of necessity, war and the like become rituals of the familiar that can echo long after the environmental rape that originally spawned them passes away. We end up with rituals embedded in our individual and cultural identity, and we end up needing warriors because we have wars. Those rituals uh, that are born out of those punctuated environmental circumstances, those acute destructive things, can lead to the demise of an individual or a culture. In other words, something that happened in our past could actually lead to repeated cycles of familiarity that eventually cause us to die as individuals or as cultures. Easter Island is a good example of that. That was once a 63 square mile island full of trees, somewhere around 1200 CE. Uh, a gaggle or so of Polynesians settled there and either by slash and burn farming or a biological tree eating stowaway like rats or beetles they brought along, started eating up all the trees. In any case, the combination of things that happened once people arrived and whatever creatures they brought along with them caused the trees to start disappearing as the people kept fruiting and multiplying. And pretty soon the island had too many people and too few resources. Poof, they could no longer support the people and the population collapsed. They did leave a legacy of some stone face thingies and some kind of stony graffiti with a particularly long shelf life. Easter Island suffered a demise because it overstepped the bounds of its environment in a destructive way. It's these kinds of chaotic environmental factors that spawn the behaviors we recognize as elements of our identity, either individual or cultural. Every language and every culture on earth, in fact, was born out of this environmental womb. We probably started with utterances like mumbo jumbalaya, which meant watch out for that saber-toothed cat, and later we advanced to things like you're ugly, batteries not included. But we have this legacy from our ancestors, our quiver full of behaviors that may have begun as adaptive and acutely necessary when it was first formed. But if it's misapplied, any behavior is maladaptive. We need water to live, but we can drown if we have too much. So our rituals can serve us, and it's fairly zippity doo da day to run on the currents of the nourishing relationship environment that we grew up in. We don't have to tediously think about it. 
But the danger emerges when our behavioral rituals become toxic in the context of an environment which, by the way, is a moving target. So something that was nourishing and necessary one day is easily destructive the next. We have to continue to contextualize our behaviors. What we've learned as an adaptive behavior can certainly become maladaptive in a different environment. The vast array of our behavioral echoes that culminate in our current repertoire of rituals is what we loosely attempt to embrace with the word identity. But in reality, what we call identity is often an untamable conspiracy of chaos over which we lay that comforting term. But our identities really can get infected with what amounts to a viral downgrade that saps away the energy we need to realize our fullest potential. And once we're infected with an attraction to destructive patterns of relationship, we express behaviors that cultivate a life beneath the threshold of our potential. And that's what we're trying to address here. So we become prisoners of our own attraction to maladaptive relationships. And what's the answer? How can we free ourselves from the momentum of what we come to know as our identity? Well, one of the chief barriers to that intentional life is a failure to recognize that the words we use as abstract cells and organs to understand our identity are also fairly inadequate. Uh, we're composed of a lot of emotions and behavioral memories for which we have no words, much less the capacity to steer those portions of ourselves with any degree of intention. This misunderstanding, in large part, is because the communication network of relationships that forms our identity is almost entirely nonverbal. The tiny speck of words we attempt to use as a membrane of understanding for ourselves is comparable to bringing a squirt gun to a raging forest fire. Most of us simply are not up to the challenge of understanding ourselves with a great deal of depth. We tend to elevate our verbal notions to some godlike status, but in fact, the foundation for what we inadequately describe as ourself is forged in a crucible of environmental communications that almost entirely outside our capacity to understand beyond the superficial. The way we demonstrate our values to each other is often driven by snippets of environmental circumstance deeply embedded in our behavioral memories. Quite often, we are nowhere near perceptive enough to expose who we are accurately with our pixie dusty words so much as use them to steer our intentional movement. The axiom of our affection is a vast conspiracy of relationships we're familiar with and that echoes, echoes. their influence from the depths of time not necessarily the ones that lead to our most fulfilled state of being. These things can actually destroy us. This thing we call nurture is often euphemistically think of as uh, warm and fuzzy, is sometimes a very cold and prickly element. The only way to cultivate movement with intention in the midst of this relational waters we find ourselves in is discipline. Bummer that it is, that's the hand we're dealt. If the happenstantial hand leads to our fullest potential, great. If we were brought up in a wonderful environment of love and caring and understanding ourselves in the context of community and building nourishing relationships, not being walked on and, and not walking on others, wonderful. We can ride that. If not, we either establish the disciplines to cultivate our fullest potential or we ride like a dead stick down a stream of chance. Blame is irrelevant, as is retribution for crimes or punishments in whatever form, our behaviors have to be contextualized with as much depth perception as we can muster if we're going to effectively cultivate a sustainable journey toward the fullest flower of our potential. So to achieve that saturated equilibrium with our environment, we have to continually nourish our opportunity. We have to recognize where we're contributing to our own destruction, and we have to make a discipline to actually change our behaviors. That's the thing that we can control. If we don't control our behaviors, we will not control our destiny. And recognizing that we only have a limited amount of power in that respect anyway, environment still is a factor. This is not going to come by hiding in the certainty that comes from a lens made of ignorance. We have to be very mindful of ourselves and engage in exploration in order to change the climate of our behaviors. We have to do our best to anticipate the rhythms that we're going to face because the environment is always a factor in determining what we should do. Ultimately, this blend of ritual and discipline leveraged towards what is nourishing and fulfilling is the true nature of our choice. Thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. I hope you got something out. Thank you.